Latin and mm -hmm. Brad Bartanian, and um, we're going to do the way that the process is going to go. We're going to talk for a little bit and kind of ask some questions and kind of set a stage for the conversation, and then we're going to really and really hopefully this will be a conversation toward the end and bring it out to the audience and you all in order to make sure about um, how we actually talk about these and see how all of these ideas are actually happening here in Houston. Um, I guess let me do my obligatory and important aspects about our um, our sponsors. Thank you very much to uh, support from the Houston Arts Alliance and the Center for Public History Lecture Series, the Catherine G. McGovern College for the Arts, the University of Houston and Houston Endowment for their support of this lecture. Um, and I think that this is one of a series that uh, the Center for Art and Social Engagement is trying to do about community conversations. How do we actually bring national figures uh, together with our local communities to connect what's happening locally to uh, the larger national discourse? Part of this is inspired by the idea that what is happening here locally is innovative and an amazing practice, but we don't really understand what that's happening because we can't, because we're in it. You all know it, you all do it. And how do we actually connect that to a national discourse? And also, how do we get our national leaders, thought leaders, to know what's happening here in Houston and actually help us catalyze that of the practice to a new level? And actually ask us questions and we ask them questions so this becomes really in a global uh, discourse. So, we're going to start with this really easy question of um, what does it mean to be an arts citizen? <laughs> was that part of the questions that you gave me before? That was your question. <laughs> that was my question. That was your question. <laughs> I, is my microphone, do I really need a microphone? My last name is loud and clear. Is it? Is it can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's on, right? Okay. It says it's on. Okay. Am on? What does it mean to be artist citizen? You want to ask for that first? No. That would be good. <laughs> <laughs> I think it means that today, I think it means to be visible, first of all. I think that's really important. I think it means to create new paths for others. I think it means to be, um, well, certainly I'm going to say this, generous in giving opportunities for others. And what art, artists have always done is lead as well. But now, more than ever, need to be louder, I think, because the value of arts, I believe, has been declining, especially in this political situation that we're in right now. So I think the artists themselves, they owe it to themselves and they, they to our community, to be able to be, like I said, a lot more visible. Um, I, would, I would agree with that, and particularly I think uh, artists now are kind of the, um, the R&D department, of, like culture often, where there's like a lot of this stuff going on in museums and with artists, I think, are, are kind of experiments that sometimes work and then kind of get expanded or like, you know, people sort of rip off them for good or for bad, but I think a lot of, a lot of the new ideas are coming from that. And I think we can see that particularly, um, you know, you just look at with a lot of the startups and the sort of the, like some of the creativity comes from the arts community in different ways, whether it's image or design or, you know, Airbnb was started by RISD. You know, as an example, like all these types of things. So it's like I think a lot of that innovation is coming um, in, in different ways. But I don't mean innovation in a sort of like in a, in a purely like product, you know, way. I mean it in terms of a lot of the real experiments, whether it's through collectives, whether it's through these types of different kinds of economic models that are sometimes explored, even housing models. You know, all these types of things. I think we, we're seeing a lot of. So I think that uh, we need to unpack a lot of this in terms of like, for the discussion. So I guess first, what I'm hearing right now is that artist is is a maker who's actually active and responsive to community or well, the environment. I, I hope so, but I, I think it's also artists who. I mean, there are a lot of artists out there who just want to paint paintings and objects and, and make sculpture, and I don't think they're or whatever. I don't think that that there's anything necessarily wrong with that. But I do think that it's important not to be beholden to the white walls or an old system, old systems, um, and to create new opportunities so that uh, we have bridges to the public and it can attract different people. Um, because I do think that there's a decline in, in uh, let's say, the market or the gallery world, if you will. I hate saying that. Um, and I hate also the art world, that exclusive community. 
Um, but it's not for everybody, and there's just too many artists. I mean, there's not too many artists, but there's so many artists coming out of MFA programs, and galleries and museums can't meet that demand. So there has to be other alternatives. Um, yeah. So this is actually linked to, I guess, uh, actually, this is part of your book tour, Artist mm -hmm. as Culture Producer. Um, and, uh, and I think that what has been interesting for me is that this is one of the ways for you to actually go in and around into national communities and hear responses and understand and test these ideas. Um, but I guess, just for context for people who haven't seen the book, if you can actually talk a little bit about why, what inspired you to put this book together and what has been, and yeah, let's, let's start with inspiration. My inspiration was because um, I graduated with a lot of debt in 2000, uh, not 2000, 1991. <laughs> oh my God, where am I? <laughs> I want to be a lot younger <laughs> um, in 1991. And when I graduated with a lot of debt, which I paid off in 10 years as an artist, um, uh, I didn't get a lot of support from the community, from other artists, and I was pretty aggravated about that. So when I was approached to be able to do a book. My first book was being, being able to start a conversation about how, art, how artists sustain a creative life, and then that book went on a 62-stop tour all over the country, and we met over 5,000 people on that tour and had a lot of exchanges, and I started noticing on that first tour that um, when I would say in public that um, introduce an artist as a culture producer, uh, the public would inquire and say, well, what is, who is that? What is that? But when I would say artist, they would just sort of not respond that way. They would have their old stereotype of an artist in their mind. Um, and then also at the same time, I met a lot of artists who only thought that the only way to sustain a creative life was um, by just having a gallery or working with a gallery, which I was really aggravated about too. So um, this second book came around to, it came about because I wanted to choose 40 artists um, that could share that not only can they have a leg in that commercial part, I call it a commercial part of uh, our world and, uh, and the art world and showing in museums and uh, exhibition spaces, but also have bridges to the public and that it is possible. Um, and then by doing that, showing that there are models that how artists can s sustain a creative life so that other artists can read those and then replicate that. Replicate them. Replicate the models. Yes. <laughs> I'm stuck on that. So, Fred, I guess, like, in, uh, with hyperallergic, and I think one of the things that I love about bloggers is that actually, uh, unlike many of the art discourse, you actually do focus on this sector, or you have a lot of, you, you incorporate this, and it's not uh, a unique, it's not a unicorn on your, um, no, on your side. Definitely not. So, I guess, can you talk about, I guess, why, why you made that, like, why you made those choices in order to include it? Well, I'll tell you, partly, it's, I don't find the commercial art world sort of being the center of the conversations I'm having, you know, and I think a lot of the best shows tend to be at museums that are more thematic, not necessarily individual artist based, and all the, I mean, I think a lot of the ideas that I, I enjoy talking about and the kind of work I love. Um, but as well as, I think the commercial gallery world treats art writing in a very utilitarian, instrumentalized way, you know, I mean, there's a reason why you go to a gallery and the reviews are at the front, right, you know, it's like, what other industry does that? Because they're cool, you know, and so as a writer, it wasn't even interesting to me, you know, so I was like, so I want to talk about ideas, and sometimes commercial gallery shows are where you can talk about them, right, especially nowadays as, as galleries sort of diversify the types of shows they do, but, you know, if for us, it's sort of like, okay, where are the ideas, where are people's interests going, where are the artists looking? And I'll tell you, most artists I know, the commercial gallery world is only one fraction of what they're looking at, and not even 50%. You know, people are looking at archives, people are looking at you know the streets, people are looking at different institutions, and I mean that's what we try to represent because that's where our interest goes as well. Those are where we think those ideas are sort of really germinating. Um, and I think, particularly for things outside of the commercial gallery model, I think it's it, it was amazing to us how much. I mean, I'll just be frank, galleries really just want reviews that are not negative. And they'll be frank. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. And you know, artists. They do. Artists, artists do too. Everyone says they want a review, and that's not true. 
right. no one wants a good review. That's right. right. You know, it's like, don't tell me you want a review. That's the reality true. is that's not what we so want. True. But people will literally call us and be like, well, I need a review. And then, you know, the publisher, thankfully, is my husband, so he just tells me. And I'll be, uh, and he, and of course, he would be like, um, no, you can't promise that, you know? And, but, and then they don't buy it. You know, it's like there's a, it's pretty silly. Well, I guess part of uh, why the uh, center's really interested in all this yeah. is that all of this is what we're talking about is moving it out of the transactional discourse, That's right? True. So it's no longer about the money, it's no longer right. about I'm giving you this <clears> and you're giving me that in return. So it's actually about these performance. These are performed experiences, and then also, hopefully, uh, respect, reflective, responsive, and responsible ways of actually interacting with the world. And I think that um, where, so I guess now, now it comes back to, we have, how do you look at these individuals, or these moments, as models, and are actually, artists are doing their thing, which is great, but then how are we actually stringing these things together? in order to create models from those things, in order to see how to act in the 21st century? Um, I think, first of all, look, we have to talk about money, like, in a very frank way. So that's, like, you know, no shame in it. Like, it's totally fine. Let's talk about money. Let's be frank. Because people are, I mean, they, I mean, they get cultural capital out of what we do, right? And whether it's cities that promise you free studios or whatever, I mean, they're all getting something out of it. But I think the arts community hasn't been happy. Personally, I think it's partly because some of the so-called spokespeople are very wealthy, and sometimes they don't necessarily care, you know, because I think it's like, I think rich people benefit from when we don't talk about money, you know, in some ways, because then it's like you don't ask for what you need, you know, and I think, and I think that's sort of part of the conversation I would like to bring in more, because I think we need to talk about it. Um, the other thing is I think trans, the transactions also, we do have to expand, because I think most of us come from cultural communities of different kinds, where culture is not just an object in a museum, right? You know, it's a lived experience. It could be a performance. It could be music. It could be, you know, like, I, I mean, I remember going to protests, you know, as a kid, and I, that was kind of part of my cultural community. You know what I mean? In a way that a museum could never, you know, really contain that experience. So I think we're also trying to understand, because I think culture and what it means has changed. Because I don't think elites are the only people determining what culture is. <laughs> so I'm just letting this, this, this in for a second. Uh, no, I think, uh, Karen, like in terms of where, how are you, where do you fit in terms of these models and um, I guess the sustainability, so, like the way that you actually talk about sustainability. I do. It's not just, it, money is part of it. But what it's other not things? just money. I mean, I think that, I, I say this a lot on this tour, um, and this is the 75th stop on this tour out of 100. And so I've said this 75 times. Is that, um, <laughs> ready? Oh, <yes. laughs> I said that not uh, artists not only contribute to the creative economy, but more, much more than that, we contribute to the well being of others. But we, as artists, have to believe that. We ha also have to know what we need and want. A lot of artists go to galleries or, or wherever uh, to be able to show their work, and they leave it up to those institutions to say, here's my work, do something with it. And then there's no ownership. There's no ownership, there's no responsibility, no planning from the artist, no selection of who they want to collaborate with. So we have a lot of work to do as a community, much more so. We have to take ownership of who we are and to be able to answer those questions first before we go forward. And also, the money part of it, sustainability, there's a lot of different economies, especially, I think, within artists, artist communities. Um, there are many examples in my book, for sure, um, and many examples out there. Um, but I, I think it's what artists value, too. It's not just uh, also the old idea of uh, the validation that an artist is someone who only uh, is successful because they sell their work. That's just a very old idea, um, and I think that an artist is much more than that. So language is important, and those first steps of that planning and understanding um, what an artist wants and needs it has to be assessed before going forward. But I guess you're also challenging the idea of what the work is, right? 
Yeah, I mean, and also looking at the work to understand what the artist needs as, as an objective person, saying, where do I want to take this? What's the journey I want to take? And maybe not what somebody else wants to do for me. I mean, beyond, I mean, I, I think artists who easily give in to referrals or recommendations from other people, if someone says that something's right for them, then they follow along because that's the validation that they think they need. But oftentimes, it may not, I mean, not oftentimes, but maybe sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But then the artist just doesn't have that relationship initially and doesn't have that intention going forward. So I guess the, this whole idea about uh, validation and, and, and finding things that, like, it, it's not about the elites who actually are, who are creating this aspect. Um, how are we actually creating that, that validation system that can sustain this? That's part of the question we're dealing with. Right. Today, because I think a lot of the structures are still very old. Yeah. You know, and I, and um, they're clearly not working I mean, the art world is definitely bigger than it was 20 years ago. I mean, probably four or five times bigger. You know, I, I'm guessing just based on my own experience. Everyone has their own of that, but um, but at the same time, you know, you know that recent stat about museum attendance being down. You know, it's like we're building institutions that maybe are not the way we should be interacting. You know what I mean? But I give you an example in New York. You know, the new culture shed project that's happening in the Hudson the Hudson. Uh, Side, the Hudson Yards. It's like, as much as I love to hate on that project, at least it's doing something different and it's doing a different kind of project that responds to different kind of cultural production. You know, so it's not just objects, and that's why it's like we really, I think it's really great if we have more spaces that are like, I'm gonna be more transient, I'm gonna like move, I'm gonna do something in a mall, I'm gonna do something here. And I think that reflects because we need, because people, we can't expect people to come to the art mm -hmm. the way we used to. Mm -hmm. Because I think we're just too distracted and I think there are too many things going on. And I mean you saw how many people got here and how long did it take? You know, I mean it's like I mean just to be like frank about that. So that means that our culture is on our screen. Our culture is, you know, in our neighborhood. It's driving through our streets or whatever. So it's going to be it's going to be decentralized. And I will tell you like in terms of hyperlogic, one of the things we did sort of conceptualize is how do we decentralize conversations about because they're not happening one place. There isn't one critic you're reading. There isn't one thing that pontificates anymore. Or if there is, I don't listen to it. Do you know, looking at different things and trying to figure out the way forward. And I think we have to reflect that decentralization. Have anything right now? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm throwing that back to you. Right. No, no, and, and, anything, and I really appreciate this concept. Like, uh, I mean, part of what we've been dealing with here in Houston is we have been touting this 21st century to most diversity in, you know, in the nation. And uh, many people have been wielding that like an ugly stick. And I think that, um, but part of coming from diverse communities, it's like, well, what does that actually mean? And, you know, and coming from these areas in which uh, content and ideas and validation is decentralized and where we're actually trying to understand, like, uh, where, yeah, sorry, I'm just also living in this as, like, where, where do we, where do I, as a director of a academic center in a university, right, 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 in right. one of the most diverse cities right, in the nation, right, right. actually try to engage community, mm -hmm. artists, mm -hmm. and, and the acad academia mm -hmm. simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is the part where, um, sorry if I'm not clear about this, but I'm struggling with this clearly for myself. And so I'm like, okay, here. Um, but how do we, I guess uh, you talked about uh, the, the, that one model in the Hudson Yards and yeah. like what that's going on and, and the decentralized. So, what are some of the other models that you, that either one of you all, have, like either seen, experienced, are really excited about that's, that this is doing? That that is doing this type of work. That is thinking well, about the same. Creative Time is an example. I mean, as much as I hate their funding, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of like it's mostly developers. You know, but I mean, at least they have a transient model that sort of like pops up these things and creates real moments, do you know, uh, that people seem to want to experience throughout a city, do you know, and I think that's pretty special. I mean, there's an example of an organization, but the, the flip side of that is that also, you know, often is personality-led, so like, you know, when somebody leaves, that organization can flounder, mm -hmm. 
right now they're in the middle of right the transition. Right now they're kind of in the transition. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's what sometimes happens mm -hmm. um, with those kinds of organizations. But I think they're like an example, and I think a lot of people are emulating, actually, um, of, of sort of doing things in a different way. So I'm really excited about two museums right now. MOCA Cleveland, Jill Schneider, the director who's been there for since 1998, and Scott Swollen at the Fulbright in Tulsa. So they're both uh, in areas that are small, smaller communities than big cities like this. And they uh, are in a great position, and they're doing fantastic things. Jill, what she's doing, I just saw her in December and got this from her, is that she has activated her board to say, we've got to do the right thing, and we have to reach out from the museum to the community, which sounds like such a simple thing to do, right? Like a lot of museums, I think, I, I think it's difficult to be to do anything in the arts because it's um, people don't get paid a fortune. Um, they ha have to have their own lives. They have very spread spread very thin, um, and the old mo and staying true to these old models too. Uh, people don't want to change so much. But she activated her board enough to say we really have to get out to the community and either and make this very open this museum much more open by having workshops by people, artists from the 99%, not from the 1%, by actually physically going out and um, meeting more people, being more visible, being active. Um, and I think Scott, Scott Stulen, who we just visited with in Tulsa in November, is really trying to change that museum by making it open and accessible um, in way different ways. Um, and I mean, many ways, right? Can I also mention a lot? Because I mean, we're talking pretty big work. I'm thinking also like something like 16 Beaver. I don't know how many yeah. of you might know that space, but that was like a radical anti-capitalist space in, in Lower Manhattan on 16 Beaver Street um, that really incubated a lot of really amazing ideas over its like 15 year history, including like people often credited for partly incubating Occupy, you know, in terms of like they were the ones who were like, there were performances going on in the space. And you know, they were creating like, this is where I'm talking about like artists are often doing the visioning you know, of like what could be, right? So like a few months before, you know, uh, a few months before Occupy started in Zuccotti Park, you know, you have like everyone from like Dred Scott to like other performance artists doing pieces in downtown Manhattan that were addressing inequality, you know? And then eventually it's sort of like when, you know, first time I went to Zuccotti Park during Occupy, the first week I realized there were a lot of performance artists there. And I was kind of taken aback, right? Like why are there performance artists here? What's the deal? And then I thought about it and I realized, of course, because performance artists understand that occupying space has a ripple effect. It doesn't matter what it is. Like, the fact is you may not be able to control what that effect is, but you know that putting a body in physical space has an impact on things around it. And so if you think of it that way, that's a kind of visioning where like a performance artist could understand intuitively that the rest of us may not sort of understand initially. And that's an example of like this totally radical bootstrap space, I mean, I'll tell you, they had no money, were able to do amazing projects. And you can sort of look up on their website, 16 Beaver, and see some of the stuff they did. It's pretty amazing. But I think in the micro, though, individual artists can do a lot, too. So we're talking about in the macro. We're yeah. talking about the, these, these organizations. Um, but certainly uh, little things, like sharing people's work on, on social media, or just inviting a uh, an artist to come in to do an exhibition in their studio, um, or to to uh, put together their own visiting artist talk series or with a group of artists, or apply to go to do a art fair together. I mean, these models are very small, but they they take care of that validation that then strengthens the artist's faith to keep going forward. That's it's actually very real, and, and that, I have found that to be the number one thing that artists need. I talked to a lot of artists out on this tour and elsewhere. The second thing is permission, which mostly women say that they need permission, which they don't need at all. And then the third thing is opportunities. But And then I didn't mention money in those three things, right? That That's after opportunities. Um, we will get to uh, local practice in just a few minutes. But I guess one of the things that I wanted to also just uh, in part of the conversation that I, I think um, 
when you talk about these institutions that are reaching out or all of the, these change, I think part of the thing for me is why are they doing this change? What is like what what are they actually responding to in order to make this change happen? Do you want the cynical answer? <laughs> <laughs> the cynical answer is funding structures and foundations that seem to like want to do social work or versions of social work. So it's like so that's the negative. Right, you know, where it's like everyone wants to put their money towards something that feels good, right. that has a product, mm -hmm. that is somehow like can create something that they can sort of go, oh look, we're doing these great things, and it's all right for selling oxycodone on the side. Oh, <laughs> um, oh wait, right. Oh. Um, she's actually going against it. No, no, not Elizabeth. Her, it's, her, it's it's actually her uncle. Right. Um, yeah, actually, you know, um, yeah, it's a funny story. Because um, I actually. Did something come out and well, yeah, you know, because we, well, you they did, but it was, we, I, I actually asked Elizabeth Sackler to, like, or her foundation to actually prove that they sold, prove that they sold their portion of the fund to adults. So they did prove it to me with paperwork. So it's like, so she did, you know, so that's good to say. But it's like, but, you know, that's, that is part of it, exactly. Like, that's part of this sort of bigger thing that we need to sort of understand. Right, and I guess the, to me it, it is about this idea of, about uh, responsibility and, 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 and value systems that we're moving in. And I think part of what we're talking about when artists are, um, when uh, on the institutional side, actually trying to go out or do, th do this work, what are the values that are driving that aspect? And how are we actually making sure that those values are actually respectful or responsive to the communities that, or audiences that they're engaging with or trying to? And I think that that's, Part of where I think that it's in, in, inherent upon the artists who are in these institutions in order to push back and actually say why are this like and not actually be instrumentalized in this uh, continuing gentrification of, of those institutions. Um, but I, I think that there's also I mean for me about the idea of uh, I guess when you talk bring up the performance artist aspect, there is an intention almost with almost with most performance artists most performers about what is the response of the audience and really understanding where the audience fits into that, mm -hmm. into their mix. And I think that this is one of the things which I have had interesting conversations with many visual arts people because they never really, they rarely had thought about uh, They have the to audience. find their audience. They have yeah. to know their audience. Yes. Sorry. So, no, I think, <laughs> why don't you talk a little bit more about that? No, I just... <laughs> No, really. You know, I, I, I feel that it's really important, like to identify who they are, and and I, I think the art, I think that our our community, our community is based on a lot on relationships, um, and so uh, I mean it's always a collaboration, no matter if someone's showing their work in an institution or they're or they're working with somebody, let's say a master printer or whatever. The other person, a gallerist, a museum person, whatever, it's working with that person, and they're not serving the artist. And so, you have to. I think the artist has to do some homework to be able to figure out who those people are and what the right fit is. Um, and I will say, like for instance, hyperallergic. I feel like we literally built it one user at a time, and I'm proud of that. Like, and I still say we keep. So it's like, I think anybody in the culture industry, there is no ready audience. Like there's no just, oh, you have to kind of find your audience. Yes, sometimes it does sort of, you can plug into a bigger audience, but I think you literally have to build it, you know? And I think I think that's something that a lot of creative people don't think about. Like there is no ready, like, and I hate that with writers. Writers are the worst at that, I think. <laughs> Even worse than visual artists, where they feel like, oh, someone will read it. You know, and I'm just like, who the hell's gonna read it if they don't know the so like, You know, it's like, and I'll tell you how my husband got me into blogging was that he goes to you, because he's an interactive marketer, and that was his sort of passion, believe it or not, I know he did. Um, but it's like, but I was like, he was like, so do you ever want to write a book? And I was like, yeah, one day, maybe. And he goes, and who's gonna read it? And I was like, people interested in the topic? Oh, yeah. yeah, and he was like, okay, let me tell you how the world works. Right, exactly. You know, and it's like, he's like, you need to build an audience for your work. And I was like, wow, that was like so, so radical. But he was right. Because he goes, even if 100 people, you start a personal blog, 100 people read it. Those are 100 people that might buy your book. It's true. That might support your work. I mean, 100 people is a lot of people. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, it's not a little number. So that's an example of like building it step by step. I mean, who, who are the people you want to breathe with, who you want to, uh, exchange with, who you want to um, 
have a long uh, dialogue with over time. Um, and there are some people in the audience that have. Oh, mad at this guy. I had lunch with him because I couldn't stand him. <laughs> <laughs> and so I asked him, what is it? What, what are you doing? Because if you're at a top of anywhere, where do you go? Does somebody take you off the hill? <laughs> do you know, then you climb down the mountain. And so I had lunch with him, and he pulled out of his wallet a list of these galleries that from New York. This happens more often than not, actually. Yeah. And, um, and it makes me crazy. So if he, these galleries, and I said, how are they going to know about you? Is there going to be infrared helicopter trying to find you in your dreams, right? And so there's a certain, there's this disconnect. And when you ask uh, the question, why is this happening now, where people are starting to move forward, I think when people get desperate, they find their ways. And we've lived in this cushy, dependent situation for a long time that's finally failing, which is a good thing, which means artists need, and they can, they're going to be forced to do this, because it's not working for everybody. Okay, I think this is perfect time for another <laughs> transition to uh, uh, our local artists. Um, so I have invited Emily Sloan and Regina Agu to actually talk about their practice and how um, they're not waiting. They're not actually yeah, they're right here. Right here. <laughs> no, but they're also not waiting for other people in order to make things happen for them. Wait, wait, they're actually helping do that. So we're going to start with Emily. Yeah, we should move. We're going to sit here? No, I think we should move. No, I think we should move. You need to move, you need to move at least closer. Closer yeah. to this. focuses on a lot of our focus on community engagement and uh, local in the keyword local endeavors and sharing and um, <clears throat> I run a space called Mystic Lion and it's on the corner of Lyons uh, Avenue and Mystic Street in um, Houston's Fifth Ward and Fifth Ward is a very underserved neighborhood <coughs> and um, at that space there, we have a window gallery and uh, so we have art on view, like installation art on view, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, come by any time, see some art. And, um, and we kick off each installation with a big neighborhood party and we'll have it, you know, like food trucks from Fifth Ward and anything we can do to incorporate the neighborhood into it. And um, let's see, even like some of the artists, this is Jesse Lott, you know, and most of y'all probably know Jesse, very well-known artist. He's had a show, show there this past year. It was, and it was actually in part of uh, 2016 too. And um, he's a very well-known artist, has art museums and all over. And he's lived in Fifth Ward over 40 something years. And um, he had a show there as did another show we had his, that showed some slides was uh, Patrick Turk. Another one, an artist, he has a, he's in publications, list as long as the arm, and he got a grant from the city of Houston to do an installation there. And uh, we also raise money to give a stipend to the artist. And so a lot of our donors are from the neighborhood, which I think is very important, uh, that people want to invest in it. Um, let's see. Lots of other things to do. We have pop-up shops, potlucks. Um, Motivation behind this is I'm a resident of the neighborhood and also just fun things to do with neighbors. Uh, like a lot of us, we may play badminton and uh, <laughs> kind of they taught me to do the gallery. But uh, so just um, kind of that relationship and friendship in our little world there. But uh, we've had, we've shot rap videos. We've had, uh, I can't even think what we've done now. Classes, good thing I'm running. Classes, meditation, yoga, in a book club. We do tours. Uh, this is a tour of this group called uh, Farm Art. They're a local a composter there in Fifth Ward. Uh, we also have work, are working with a food co-op that 
uh, there's a lot of urban farmers in Houston, and we deliver food around the floor every Wednesday. So that's another thing that we kind of have to bring about. And um, it's also led to a lot of, or some civic engagement more recently, like working with some local businesses. There was a man we just saw, oh yeah, Mr. Uh, Hilton Slides Back, Mr. Russo. He has a, yeah. He uh, has a funeral home that's been in business 80 years. His mother founded it, and he's, we're working on starting a chamber of commerce to support a lot of this old businesses that have been there a long time. And uh, we also have some meetings coming up. Like we're working on lot size requirement to preserve housing, and um, it's a lot of things like that they've become, that are working out of that. Uh, currently, we're also working on a parade with the Lions Avenue Renaissance Festival coming up. We're helping get some art bars and walkers and people parasols and just kind of activating activating in that way. And so this is it. This is our little corner of the world. Mystic of Lions, you know where to find us. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Regina Arbor, and um, I'm just going to talk about a couple of collaborative projects that I worked on over the past few years. So um, I do have a studio practice where I make drawings and collages, um, photographs, um, I write and work across different media. But um, it's been really important to me over the time while I've developed my studio practice to always remain engaged with um, the communities of artists and collaborators and activists that I feel like have sustained me in my work. Um, not to get too much into background, but um, I come from a background in policy studies, actually. So, um, and the first group of artists that I met after moving to Houston was the Houston chapter of the Blackout Artist Collective. And that's how I met, um, was introduced to Project Row Houses, the Community Artist Collective, um, and so it's really important for me to stay grounded in those communities. And um, my studio practice is, has, uh, encompasses a lot of things, but I'm really interested in looking at the relationships between communities of color and the landscape. And um, I think it's really important to explore that um, as an artist working in the Gulf Coast region and Houston specifically. I think there's a lot of individual um, with uh, unique challenges and opportunities as being part of this creative landscape. So um, one of the projects I work on um, with uh, Gabriel Martinez is uh, we collaborated on this project, Friends of Angela Davis Park, in 2014. And um, the project ended because the space that we were occupying was uh, taken over by the restaurant parking lot and then slated for office development. But um, when we kind of occupied this space, uh, is, uh, we played around with the idea of the um, park committee, that's why we named it Friends Of, and thought about what a public space in Houston would look like uh, in terms of programming in a space that was dedicated to an American radical thinker. It was really important for us to bring in ideas around um, Houston and its role in the private prison industry, and Angela Davis is a prison abolitionist, and then also looking at the kind of unique um, policies that um, guide the way that Houston develops and redevelops itself over time. And so this project included um, picnics, workshops, poetry readings, public gatherings. We also developed um, printing material that was distributed for free to the community, um, talking about um, prison statistics, Houston's role in, in private prisons and state incarceration. And um, it was a kind of good way for us to assemble a community in a way that was um, collaborative. Um, the projects were, um, the events that we hosted were all um, suggested by community members that included artists and others. Um, over in 2014 and 2015, um, over a two-year period, I led a group of um, private meetings with women of color in the community, um, and it was called, the project didn't really have a name, but it was just called Women of Color Reading Group. 
where we got together, I hosted monthly brunches, and we would um, discuss contemporary issues in politics and art making. We would read women, uh, womanist and feminist texts by writers of color, and um, just hold community conversations. And it was important for me to have these meetings privately um, so that the members of this collective, and I call it a collective, but um, the members included artists, activists, um, filmmakers, anthropologists, academics, and just general community members. Um, I wanted to create a space where we could discuss these issues um, in a safe environment and in, uh, to bring up the particular issues that relate to women of color um, in discussing these texts. And taking the reading group. So reading groups are a part of my practice. Um, I organize a lot of reading groups. Um, and I think part of that comes from, uh, you know, as I said, coming from kind of a non-art background. One of the ways that I've learned about contemporary practices and art making and collaborative models are from other artists sharing texts with me and developing these projects together. And so um, I was invited to elsewhere as a Southern Constellations Fellow um, North Carolina in 2015, and um, it's a fellowship where artists kind of working across the South are able to come in and explore experimental projects and practices at Elsewhere. And so in addition to the project that I worked on in the library, which is an index of their collection, I also hosted a re another closed reading group for women of color in the Greensboro community to come to the space and discuss the texts and the books that were um, part of the Elsewhere collection. And we developed collectively um, a series of photographs and printed texts. And then um, over the past couple of years, um, 2014 to 2017, um, I co-directed Alabama Song, which is an art space in Fairview. Um, it's an intimate art space in a home and um, it's very flexible. Uh, we kind of describe it more as a flexible space rather than an art space because it involves um, a lot of non-art projects as well. Um, we host a lot of workshops for activists, community members, uh, silk screening, um, lectures. Uh, we participated in art fairs. There were poetry readings, music events. But it was really important for us to develop a space where um, we could present non-commercial um, difficult to fund, um, flexible projects that were programmed by the community. And so um, this is just, there's no real way to talk about all the programming that's happened. It's been about five years of programming, but these are some of the posters and event shots and um, other programs that we produce. So thank you. So I guess uh, Emily and, and Virginia, you're coming up here too. I know I didn't actually to tell you that beforehand. Um, all right, so I guess this is uh, uh, one of the reasons why uh, I wanted to uh, highlight Emily and Regina. I'm going to be standing in the movie. Um, it uh, is is about this idea about artists and citizens, artists and citizens, and I think that Houston has um, a lot of history of uh, of uh, manifesting that work. We have Project Row Houses, um, and even just looking at almost all of our like alternative arts institutions actually grew as collectives or as uh, institutions that were about the people coming together as people, and how do the people actually need to, actually, I guess, uh, how, how do they create spaces that weren't in the major institutions? And um, I guess this resonates with me, living and actually coming from diverse works for as long as I did. And I think that, um, but we look at Project Row Houses, we look at Diverse Works, we look at uh, the Bondale, we look at uh, Aurora Picture Show, we look at Box 13. All of these are, once again, coming from a collective of artists trying to create new spaces into the world and actually coming together and how do they interact. I think a lot of it has been about generative and generous practices and bringing people together. Um, but it was also challenging other people's perspectives and perceptions about art. I just, I just wanted to sort of echo, I love the project you know, about the Friends of the Park, because I think part of it, what th that reminded me of, is sometimes the structures are already there that we just have to take advantage of. And I wanted to sort of just mention one other project, kind of like in that vein, where it's sort of like the structures are there, we take advantage. In, um, San Francisco-based artist, Amy Balkan, 
has been working on This Is Public Domain, where she actually takes tracts of land and then turns them over to the public so that nobody can ever own them. You know, and this is an example of like using existing laws or structures like a Friends of a Park, you know, and say, this already exists, how can I use these structures and then do something interesting? And she was able to transfer a piece of land in California so that nobody would ever own it in a public domain. Do you know, as a way, and that's like, wow, she was able to navigate the legal system to sort of do that that way. And in the same way, you were like, I could take a Friends of a Park, this is an established structure, and how do I make it into something there's also an organization, I just talked to the, uh, the ED, uh, Project Art, which is uh, residencies for artists and libraries all over the country. So using a, a space that's been used for a long time for one purpose, and then bringing artists in to just be there and do their work and interact with people who come in. It's a, uh, obviously a quiet space, a sleepy space, but activating it differently. So now this is the time when you all get to respond with questions, comments, concerns. Hopefully we've talked about a lot of things that you all get to. Yes. Well, um, there was somebody who did have a show at the Project Room House in um, the St. Bavon, and she's in Presidio, and she went and took the, um, one of the barracks there and turned it into a community art center because she used to be in the Mission District and she was trying to reach out to the Mexican kids and so, or the Latin community. And so she moved it over to these barracks and you know, they have these huge hallways opening to just wasted space. And she got one little room to be her office and uses the corridor to do all the community workshops with the kids and and gets community support for all of this. Anyway, that's great. She's been doing it for a few years, and she almost tanked, but thanks to social media and her friends reaching out to Houston for all of us, you know, kept it going. And she's just not a social media person, but she realized that she really needed to get on board with that. So I guess one of the things is that um, I hope that you all are here because you agree with this idea that artists and, uh, need to be act as more citizens and that you are not looking for transactional relationships. So um, we'll just accept that as a, a common denominator here. Um, but then I guess in, in that, what are the needs that we, what are the needs for you as artists, for arts organizations, and for all of us in order to continue to make that more of a reality and not um, a side gig? I'd like to respond because of that assumption that we're all here that, which I, I do, of course, agree that artists should be citizens. But I also, as someone who tries to support and, and present the work of artists, I've always wondered about this very thing that you're saying, Sharon, about artists' job being to build their own audiences. Because I've always thought, like, oh, well, maybe they should not have to work, well, some artists mm -hmm. shouldn't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. If that's not what they set out to do, maybe sometimes they need to partner with us and that should be our job to help to develop that audience for them so they can focus on whatever else it is that, you know, because I mean, different work takes a different amount of time to produce. So I guess some work is so intricate that like, how are you gonna divide up your time um, um, if, if you really wanna make the best work possible? So like, I, I'm wondering about this question of collaborating with institutions and productive ways as opposed to leaning on institutions in unproductive ways. I don't think it's necessarily uh, uh, productive. Um, well, let me back up a little bit because you said some things. There is one thing that um, got my back up a little bit. Um, I think that the the thing is is that part of what I'm hearing in your in the question is that maybe an artist could be far more productive if they don't have to do those things, right? Is that what you're saying? I, I'm wondering about it. I'm really asking the question of right. what, if all artists should do this. Well, should is, is um, that's an interesting word for this. Or should have to. Well, I, I, I think the reality is, in my research from doing these books, but also I'm working on two more right now, and I can just tell you that the reality is, no matter how, there's really a big, a big difference between perception and reality of an artist's life. And 
even the most, quote, famous artists, and I just tweeted this out today because I was aggravated about this, is that they, they, even the most famous artists, still have to do a lot of that work. So they, if, even if they have eight galleries, you know, like Callum Innes in, in Edinburgh, so a friend, friend who shared with me, you know, a lot of his day is just making these phone calls and coordinating with his partners. And it's part of the reality of being an artist and accepting that. Um, I think I've also found, too, that Tony Fair once told me, um, rest in peace to Tony, is that when he would leave it up to, let's say, Pace, when at, at one point was representing him, to photograph his work, he noticed that all the photographs were terrible because it didn't have his involvement in that. So there has to be some, at, 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 at least I've found, some kind of involvement. Now, I, do, I applaud partnerships. It's always a collaboration. As I said, but finding that medium where both of them come together, the partner and the artist, and what's going to work best. But as far as should goes, I, I, I personally don't think the reality is any longer that artists just do make their work. I know that you're not saying this, but I'm going to exaggerate of like the old ideas of someone who paints and then they leave to have dinner and then they go back to their studio mm -hmm. and do it talk to anybody or, you know, leave, work in isolation, I really think those days are over. I can say that confidently. And just, to, just to add to that, um, I think there's also, in terms of um, what artists are doing, like, I think in that older scenario, there's actually more chance for victimization and abusive scenarios if you're yeah. not in control Dependence. of depend, like, in that relationship. So, like, artists should maintain their own email lists or, you know, know be able to meet the these types of things because then all of a sudden you might be in a scenario where all of a sudden that's taken away from you and you're like what do I do now you know and and so I think and I think that's true of curators and writers too you build your own relationships and you build those email lists or whatever you do because um, I think that's important because what if you're not affiliated with an institution so what are you doing just building value for them and then what do you take with you you know what I mean so I think that's actually true across the board because we don't retire at one I mean, it's so rare, you know, and so it's like, so you're not necessarily, so I, I wonder, it's like, take, how do you take that with you sometimes and be able to create that and be mutual, you know, it's like sort of like, oh, maybe we do it together. I think it works better too, just to end on this, that uh, from what I understand from artists I've spoken with, when they do feel like they're involved, more involved and have a say, rather than just saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and we're going to leave each other alone, not that that's what you're saying, but sort of like an old model of what it used to be. Terry? I think, I don't know, it depends on all sides of everyone's opinion about this, but the part I want to push back on is maybe the championing of the artist as this worker that will be able to self-manage in all aspects of every support that they need. They will build themselves. They will create it if it doesn't exist. And I actually really don't think the days of like being in the studio and then having some of the ways that artists can, as um, specialists in this one area of having sensoriums and noticing what's in the world, take up space, uh, avow the different economies and varieties of economies that you're talking about, and also do things like create support structures like playing badminton with your neighbors, which is fun, and getting the food that you want, and having reading groups, which is what you do there, not in a way that it's okay, now an artist does it all and has to do it all and has to cultivate their own audience and has to be the best capitalist that ever lived and is so creative and will build a city. So why did you bring up capitalist in that scenario? <laughs> in that scenario, because what I think part of the undercurrent of the conversation is what, how should artists be productive? How must artists produce? How must they perform? How should Never they... Never said that. I didn't, not like maybe specifically, but in the context of how productive should artists be, the idea uh, that it should be, we should all be a one-stop shop completely and not rely on other networks of support? No, I think it's always a collaboration, as I mentioned, with another, I mean, I don't think an artist can do it by themselves at all, actually. But I do think the kind of partnerships are different and how an artist goes into those partnerships with a different mindset than it used to be. And I, I think that everybody, uh, uh, like I know that there are things I can't do, right? And then there are things I can do. And 
knowing what I can or can't do, and then reaching for different people who can assist with me with that or partner with me in that. I think that, that for me, that this is part of what um, where it's going back to our part of our earlier conversation is that really where is the power of the artist in this aspect? Correct. What are you actually bringing into this? Correct. And it's like you are not, you, we are not the commercial developer. Correct. But where, what is the the potency of a, a creative force in that? And what are you actually claiming in that? And some of it actually, to me, is coming from the studio and those moments that you are actually creating. But also, how are you inter engaging the world and understanding what those collaborations are? Mm -hmm. But giving up the idea of you as a creative force is actually the worst thing that we could actually be doing as presenters, producers, or any of those type of work. It is about, I mean, part of, I think, what Karen and I, and like we continue to struggle with, is like what, where do we as institutions help artists fulfill your creative mandate, mm -hmm. but also figure out ways in order so that mandate is actually expanded or amplified. But I think Karen, um, and uh, would you say that it's on a case by case basis? Would you both say that? Where it's just individual, isn't it? Where you can assess that? Yes. I mean, that's, I start by asking how to help. That's kind of what I was asking right? you. Well, I, but I think that what we're also talking, like, but we're also talking about models here. We're also trying to figure out what, what are, how are we actually going to create systems of support? How are we going to, like, we can't just. We live in a capitalist society. We live in infrastructure that doesn't actually suit this behavior. How are we actually going to work together in order to create that infrastructure that actually moves these things forward? Right. And so it, it, it should be individualized. But our society doesn't work in that individualized yeah, it's a big, way. Big um, and also, uh, I'll also point out that the for-profit model, as much as is we like to poo-poo on it, is actually really useful for a lot of things. For instance, I remember like asking Paul Chan a few weeks ago, sort of like, why did you do a for-profit for Bad Lands Unlimited, the new Delhi publishing sort of project? And he said, probably the same reason you did a type of logic for-profit. It's like to be political, the nonprofit system does not really help the actively political. Confrontational work. It just doesn't. Trust me, your funding is going to dry up. You know, um, you could read the, fun, the Revolution Will Not Be Funded, which is actually a really good book on that topic, where they talk about like sometimes. So those different models also benefit from that too. Um, so that there is a utility and a use there. And I want to go back to you for a second. I think I think it's it, it is it, it is individualized. I'm also I'm also not saying that the gallery world is over either. I just see it declining and. It everyone's expectations, but it's just part of the ecosystem. But I think it's the best time, I've been saying this actually for three years, it's the best time to be an artist, because there's so many different opportunities and lack of judgment that there used to be 20, 25 years ago of just starting things on your own. So I think the independence and, and the uh, things that you choose to do are yours. And I just want to sort of, the reason I push back a little is because I don't think it's an either or. Right. That's why it was like I was trying to say it's like it's actually much more of a spectrum that way. I don't think it's just one or the other. I think you can be, I don't know how I would picture this um, within the use of gallery model. But it's not like I would just put in all these base pairs for forms of support that feels useful to the artist internally and allow them to have more space for negotiating forms of value that maybe are not the same as what the old model would have said is what good artists do. you talked a lot about old models being broken. And my question kind of can go two ways, and I hope this answer will go two ways. One is, uh, I'm a product of an art college and an art high school. Yes. Um, I'm a working artist and also an educator. And so I wonder how the uh, art school model um, oh, falls into this. <laughs> also, I know it's a humor. But also, on the other side of it, I also teach with literacy through photography. So a way that artists engage with their community is through teaching. And so how that kind of folds into conversations about artists and 
so this just came up in Austin. It was a big question in Austin. There were a lot of educators in the audience. And um, that system. Um, I, I, man, it's just so, I'm having a lot of problems with it recently, too, just personally, just thinking back on myself as an artist, questioning, should I have gone to these institutions? I do feel like I'm institutionalized. <laughs> um, but I feel, I, I feel like they're, they were useful for me. I do believe education is important. And I, I, I'm a big believer in a graduate program for people who want to go and get more education. Um, but to use it to their benefit, to actually participate. I think oftentimes students, when they have studio visits, they leave all the power up to somebody who's coming in to determine things. And then that's replicated when they leave in, to being professional artists, which drives me crazy. So again, taking ownership. But also, you know what institutions can do, and I've been saying this a lot lately, is they can choose visiting artist programs from the 99%. They can actually show and bring people in who are going to be generous, create opportunities for students, stay in touch with the institution beyond it, the time that they are there. There are many. I can send you a list if you give me. I swear I've, I've, I've circulated this list. Um, but instead of having like the big critics who, there's two critics who, anyway, they suck out <laughs> all the funding for the, whole, for the whole thing that don't do that. That, that, that don't participate in cultural reciprocity, so make those changes. And also, it may sound really corny, but stay contemporary as to who an artist is. There's so many divisions still, and curriculum has to change, which is such a hard thing, because when curriculum changes, there's a chance that um, you may lose a line item and may lose funding for those things. Um, and, and then also the validation, like I was in, um, uh, where was I? Um, I don't remember. San Antonio the other day. God, I can't believe it. In San Antonio on Saturday, and there were people at a dinner that said um, that the, the fine arts department is losing more and more funding because they're not be, being relevant to the rest of the community. So that's also the responsibility of you, is that you have to make it relevant to that the whole society by which you're, the whole school, essentially. Do you mind if I ask the artist? why you choose to do what you do under, under art, you know, as an art project. Because I think there are some things that you do that you could do outside of sort of the art community, and I'm curious why that's the one you choose. It seems natural to both of you. Like you're, you're naturally generous in the way that you're creating these opportunities. <clears throat> Do you, you probably don't even think about it as natural. And um, for me, with uh, the new song, um, and like I said, I um, just until very recently, I've been working, you know, working with Alvin and Song over a four-year period. And so for me, a, a lot of what kind of project, you know, is like, what kind of project would I like to present, you know, that's not even finished yet, and look for community um, feedback, or um, presenting works in progress, or, um, you know, incubating other artists' projects, and trying to find ways to, you know, connect with other artists, and share resources, and um, just provide a space for um, kind of maybe filling a hole maybe. A lot of projects do this, but you know, kind of looking at the existing um, Houston arts infrastructure, like looking at the landscape of institutions and funding and all of these things, and finding out that there are these little gaps that we can help meet um, just by, um, for at least the first few years, completely self-funding and then um, sharing resources with our community members. 
so I moved to that case. The West Area Journal. Um, for some of the other projects I worked on, like Homes of Liberty or this park, um, and then some of my studio work, um, I think because I'm a person that already had a foot in a different world outside of the art world, bringing in other disciplines and other ways of working is very natural to me because it's how um, I initially like just developed the projects. So that's something that just remains in a lot of the projects that I do. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to add to that is um, with something being under the art umbrella, because some of these things, I guess, could be could be evolved into something else, of course, later. Of course. But with it being in the under the art umbrella, I think there's more freedom. I think you can explore and push things without having to meet a certain criteria on the point. You know, like there's good and bad about that. I mean, when you're a social worker, you have a paycheck. You know. <laughs> <laughs> hesitate to use the word solutions, but there are ways to approach problem solving that I think um, are best suited to or coming from art making and other creative disciplines that you might not get from other perspectives. So I think it's not it's important to not dismiss that. tell you after I finished my graduate degree um, in art history actually um, I didn't work in art at all I was tired of art I was sick of it I was just like I thought it sucked all the joy out of it for me and, <laughs> and, and like a lot of things so 10 years I went and worked in humanitarian non-profit cultural things and I'll tell you some people did have this sort of idea like well you weren't doing you know what happened those 10 years and I was like I learned a lot and I brought it with me and let me tell you I don't regret it at all because it was like oh I will find my way back in, and I did, you know. But it and, I, and if I didn't, I didn't, you know what I mean. But it's that's all right too. But I think it actually made me a better critic, writer, editor, all these types of things where I can like bring that experience. So I didn't feel the need for a treadmill. And I do see young, particularly artists, writers, whatever you want to say, like people will show up literally right for allergic, like within the first year and be like, I feel like I'm not accelerating enough. And I'm like, you're 23. Like, <laughs> real story. Real story. And I'm just like, you're 23. Like, what are you doing? Relax. But this is, but this, you're right. It's a real thing that people feel. Where you're like, but what is your end goal? Is it just to be famous, rich? Like, I, I don't care. Like, that, I'm not gonna help you with that. Like, that's fine. What do you? How about you two? What do you think about that? Destination or something you're heading towards, but I don't know, it's like a philosophy kind of. And then also, even of, you know, like defining success, like maybe, like what really is success, you know, like yes, correct, top of the mountain. But also, maybe it's like what makes you happy. Exactly. Like, I, like, I know, I like a long time. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so, like, you know, when I really think about what I want, right. and then I think, making sure I'm, I get that. I don't know what I'm really trying to do. But anyway, oh, but, but it, uh, you know, it makes you, but you're, you realize what's your definition, like, what makes you tick. And then I think if, exactly. if you're not, like, um, you know, heading, like, toward this one thing, you realize this is more a lifestyle than getting what I need. What do I really want? That's the thing is, what do you really want? That's exactly. This is what I'm saying. That's well, if you don't know what you you want, you know what you need, and if you don't know what you need, you sure as hell know what you want. Yeah. I guess part of the thing for me is that creative process isn't linear. Mm-hmm. Correct. And That's so really why are you point. assuming that your, your career point. is going to be linear? That's and a great point. Can you guys hear me? Would I be okay? Mm-hmm. Um, this makes me uncomfortable. Um, I think, you know, for me, you know, I'm someone that I have an individual practice that's really active studio practice. I have several And um, in addition to like finding other ways to like fund my own work, and um, even though it's something that I definitely struggled with at various points over the past few years, I, you know, I think about success or you know so the issue, the idea of sustainability is, is really important to me. So thinking like not only how can I have a successful project or practice, but like how is it sustainable? Like how can I sustain my, myself as an artist? Um, not just in terms of money, but like energy and being able to like devote time to these projects. And so um, I think for me it was important to keep the structures flexible, like to keep the work flexible and knowing when I need to like step away from something or when I can continue to, you know, devote more time to it. And um, yeah, and just thinking like even thinking about Alabama song in terms of the individual is part of I'm thinking about that as like part of my art practice then instead of like this me developing a new institution that now has to be sustained for the rest of my life you know like um, that also gives me more freedom to decide how I'm going to allocate my time and, and what feels good you know with this the different career that I have now so yeah um, I have a question so you're all I have to find another word for productive but you're all you're all making um something in cultural cinema. You're producing culture. And um, I'm very, if anyone's ever seen any of the artist talks that I help facilitate, I'm very process oriented. So we've been talking a lot about philosophy. I would be very interested to know <clears throat> from your four distinct perspectives, uh, one example of the ways that you have created your audiences. I'll, I'll tell you something like that. I know it sounds ridiculous, but you know, people when people reach out to me just to like meet for lunch, I do that. Do you know what I mean? If I can, I totally do it. And I don't have to necessarily know you that personally. I mean, it'll be in the public, so I think I'll be safe. But like, but still, like you know, I will meet with that person. And that's I know it sounds silly, but it's one on one. And I don't know what's going to happen. Like you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but there's a potential there. That's like a very simple way, but it's something I still do. You know, or get on the phone with someone. I have a feeling you're going to be busy tomorrow. That's fine. I'm fine with that. But, you know, and, but it also means that I also know how to say no when I can't do it. And I'm fine with that, too. Do you know? So, you know, so I had one artist, like, reach out to me and be like, I want to be on Hyperallergic. I don't know how to. I said, well, okay. I have some time. Why don't we have a phone call? I talk to him. What do you do? Like, you know, who are you? Like, what's the deal? You know, it's like, okay, well, this might fit. Maybe. Why don't you give me a call back when you do this thing you're saying? You know, if I can do that, great. I'm gonna right, but you know what I mean. But that was very personal. I think when you collaborate with, or collaborate with people, you're really that builds your audience too. I guess or both of y'all are building for each other. Another way, this is like just being real literal. It's like with Mystic Lion, the important thing we do is because uh, a lot of people that come to our events. I don't know necessarily they're all like following this line on social media. So one day, I think I had a picture of signs. We put signs everywhere. We had hand painted signs. Let me stick out if it went out in front of the building. People know what's going on. If it went on the door. Uh, we do simple things like that. It would say all are welcome so people know they're there, come in, what's going on. Yeah, so like, and that's a uh, real pre social media. But just to kind of make sure we're reaching the audience we want to reach, which is people local, like people right there. They come in and knowing, like,
like, this isn't just, you know, a private party going on. Come on, come in. space or to the project as they are, um, and that can include artists and non-artists, and, you know, it can, I think, a lot of reach can be developed that way as, as well. Um, I think word of mouth is still incredibly important in the modern of social media and the internet, um, and social media is only going to get bigger and better, but, you know, I think they're, I think all of it is going to be important. I remember. to know Sharon Butler. She wrote something on her blog. It was like just a couple sentences. I said, hey, I, I love what you wrote. Can we have a coffee? And now she's in both my books and we collaborate a lot and she's a close friend. And um, But I usually go with my gut and it, it usually works like 90% of the time. But I'm doing that less and less. Like now I'm being so much my collaborative team, if you will, a group Well, um, I, have, I have a very broad spectrum of things that I've done, but what I do for a living these days, I'm a hairdresser and oh, makeup artist. Fabulous. Hair is very important. I have a chance to <laughs> Seriously. It is. And very important. I became a founding board member for Diverse Works that way. Oh, my God. Because I'm cutting the founder's hair. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so good. <laughs> and, you know, and I've worked in film and production. That's great. I was Pacifica Radio programmer and many other things. Anyway, and I've had a show at the Roadhouses and, oh, that's great. and and others. I've been on stage and behind the scenes. So, so but the thing is I'm curious, but and I think it's like, oh sure, I'll try it. I'll do anything just for the experience. But what I found with my captivated audience in the chair who are board members on institutions is we have the coming up the same conversation if it becomes too insular people don't cross pollinate what you're doing is beautiful it's very important. you're reaching out to the community instead of the same old people over and over again and um this was a big problem over at pacifica they just didn't step up their game with social media and it's a media station that doesn't take corporate funding and depends on community support and so people just get real stuck in a rut. And a lot of artists, really good artists, they you can't even have a conversation with them about all the things you just spoke about. And so you just reiterated everything I've been saying for years. Oh, no, I can't do that. They want to walk in the gallery and let them do all the work. They, they better not be complaining. Exactly. That's what happens in the other but, end. But it's so wonderful what you guys are doing because um, it's these institutions just keep reaching out to the same people for money, and you just can't do that. And I feel like artists need to go to the gallery and say, how are you going to sell my work? You know, what, what are your plans to um, market my work? You know, so they can make sure that they're not just giving them this upscale gallery and they're just going to sit on a shelf. So, um, you know, cross-pollinating is so important, and that's, one, that's on my business card, so pollinate. Okay, so um, we are pretty much at time, uh, and I, I think that we also want to leave some time in order to uh, you know, purchase books um, uh, in, in the direct with Sharon and Rod. 
and um, uh, and also, but I, I don't like. Well, we have to thank our supporters again. These are our clients: the University of Houston uh, Center for Public History Lecture Series, City of Houston. All that. Um, but I also think that uh, part of this conversation and part of what the center uh, is, uh, for arts and social engagement is trying to do is how do we continue these conversations outside of this? I think that this is hopefully has been an interesting conversation with you all. Um, but this is also a way that we've repeated these conversations through the summit, through other conversations we've had with other community uh, conversations. What do you all need in order to do, in order, like, do you all need us to be a convener of these types of things and consistently do that? Beyond us being a convener, what do you all, what are you all going to do on your own in order to make this happen? I mean, one of the reasons why we bring Emily and Regina up here is that they have not waited for institutional support in order to do this work. They have actually recognized what is important for them and their creative process and made that happen. Houston has a history of allowing and supporting that work. I hope that there are other people in this room that you are actually asked to support your work in order to do that. If you haven't asked somebody in this room in order to support your work, there's 15 minutes to do that. <laughs> um, so uh, also there's all and this and then there's my social media and website. Sorry, I'm really bad at it. But the other thing is that Sharon, Frog, and Steven are talking tomorrow at the camp at camp to talk about artists and the institution, which will be, I think, a little different than the conversation. A lot different. Um, but first, I want to thank you all very much for sharing your work, sharing your thoughts. So, a round of applause for that. Uh, it would behoove me not to say, because it was a free event, there is a little kitty there, so you can add some donations if you want. Also, we can purchase, like, there are uh, books to purchase, and uh, there's more conversations to be had, not just tonight. Can Thank I just you. say something? Thanks to everybody for coming, and I also want to say thanks to Stephen and Protofest for also contributing for us being here, and then just some people, one person in my life has been here for a long time, who's been in my life, open and accessible, and has always treated me well, is Andrea Eden from Diverse Works. Thank and you. Just incredible things, and so um, I encourage you all to go look up Alabama and Song on social media. I've seen a lot of people here that have done things with the space and have been audience members, and so um, thank you for having us. So the next event for the Center for Art and Social Engagement uh, is in partnership with Project Row Houses on February 21st. We are going to be having a pop look um, uh, in the lunch in order to introduce um, our new 2018 Project Row Houses Case Fellows, which includes Regina Agu. What? Oh. 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 From, uh, from uh, Oklahoma. Um, they will be doing a lecture that evening, and there will be more details to follow. So, February 21st, it's Wednesday. Um, and yeah, and it will be on our website and, and follow on Facebook because that's basically the easiest way for me to put things up. Thank you all very much. <laughs>